Welcome to Nerdiverse Presents, April 2014. I'm Marley Nelson. And I'm Dan Levy. We have a lot of great news for you today, so let's get going. This month, we had the first teaser trailer for the Michael Bay produced Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movie, starring Megan Fox and Will Arnett. I gotta be honest with you guys, it looked pretty fun. It, it looked okay. I mean, there was definitely a lot of teenage, there was definitely a lot of ninjas, but it's the mutant turtle part that we're a little worried about. Uh, the look wasn't as crisp or common or what you're expecting. He went more with the mutant route, so hopefully it won't be that big of a deal, but we'll see. I gotta be honest, guys. All we need is some light story, heavy action, vanilla ice, and then we're gonna be okay. Go ninja, go ninja go. So guys, in Marvel Nerdiverse news, uh, exciting rumors, Amazing Spider-Man 2 and X-Men Days of Future Past are actually going to have promotional tie-ins together. Now while this doesn't mean that they're actually going to appear in the same movie universe, this is still a step in the right direction. At least the companies are starting to work together. That's right guys, baby steps. We're going to get where we need to be, we just have to give it time. What's great with these movies though, is that we're going to get some spin-off solo movies. We're looking at a Gambit movie. Deadpool, and Mystique. Casting should be interesting. Well, speaking of that, Channing Tatum's already shown interest to be Gambit. Uh, I'm sure Jennifer Lawrence is the front runner over Rebecca Romaine for the Mystique movie. And then for Deadpool, I don't know about you, but I really can't see anyone else playing Deadpool but Ryan Reynolds. Ryan Reynolds is the only one to play Deadpool. And I gotta be honest, Magic Mike is Gambit? I could get down with that. In DC Nerdiverse news, it looks as though Gotham... Arrow, The Flash, and Constantine could all be part of one larger DC universe in line with the new upcoming movies. This could be a lot of fun, and we may finally see Stephen Amell in the Justice League movie. Here's hoping. That's pretty exciting news, especially building a to cohesive television universe. Movies may be introduced in that as well. Batman vs Superman, you never know, but they are making The Collider, one of their comic books, into the Federal Bureau of Physics, which will be a movie coming out very soon. And basically this is just about FBI, FBP, looking at different physics and anomalies that are happening in our world. So it should be interesting, and if we can have real superheroes in that world, even better. Also in DC Cast It News, it looks as though Holly Hunter will be playing famed character Dr. Leslie Tompkins in the upcoming Superman Batman movie. Now, as we all know, this character is extremely important to the Batman mythos because this is the surrogate mother that Bruce Wayne needed. That's all well and good, but give me Martian Manhunter or give me death. That's all I'm going to say. So guys, Battlestar Galactica is going to be gutted by Universal for a new movie. Gone! This is completely unnecessary, and I cannot in good conscience watch this unless Starbuck is Katie Sackhoff. Yeah, yeah, guys, we, uh, uh, just give us Katie Sackhoff. There are truly no words for this. In Walking Dead news, it looks as though Negan will be making his television appearance, because that was necessary. I'm just glad they're finally trying to get back to the roots of the show and really go back to the source material, because, yeah, TV kind of wandered. Oh, like they did in season three? Or season four? Or how they promised to do it in season five? Yeah, I'll hold my breath. In movie Nerdiverse news, a lot of exciting stuff, but really can't talk about April 2014 without mentioning Captain America 2, The Winter Soldier. Came out April 4th, made a billion, gajillion, gazillion dollars, and you know what? It was fantastic. Gotta be honest with you, I agree. Sebastian Stan stole the show as The Winter Soldier. And Anthony Mackie, amazing as the Falcon. These guys were great superheroes and also great super dream boats. Well, that might be true. It was still a little disheartening for a diehard fan like me to see super spy Natasha Romanoff, a very Russian character, speak in a very thick Jersey accent. So, nitpicking, small things. Scarlett Johansson, still a great actress, still wonderful to look at. So, all in all, Definitely check this out. April 16th has the limited release of Ant Boy, a charming tale of a little boy who gets bitten by a radioactive ant. It's cute. Yeah, guys, very cute story. It actually borrows some from Spider-Man's origin stories, a little from the Ant-Man timeline, and you know what? Even a little kick-ass to kind of meld it all together to make something really friendly for the family. 
This is for the little superheroes at home. If you want to really introduce them to the full canon lore that is superheroics. And the bad guy looks super cool. The Flea. Because he's, you know, a flea. It's cute. In the DVD Nerdiverse, we had 47 Ronin, which was released on April 1st. Now, this is a traditional Japanese uh, folklore tale it's about 47 masterless samurai that come together to save their world. And, of course, Hollywood got the most Asian actor they could at the time, so it stars Keanu Reeves. I could sum this up. <laughs> no! Don't watch it. Really? April 8th had the release of The Hobbit, The Desolation of Smaug. Smaug. Oh, Benedict Cumberbatch's sexy. It's a Hobbit movie. It was good. Martin Freeman, Ian McKellen, Hobbits. You know what you're in for. But most importantly, it's about Smaug. Ben. So guys, in the TV Nerdiverse news, we had five episodes of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. this month. Uh, we're just going to talk, try to get you afloat, and try to get you up to date with what's been happening. Basically, Deathlock's been running amok, making everyone go crazy. Meanwhile, the rest of the Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. are trying to figure out who the clairvoyant is, and whether or not they have ties to S.H.I.E.L.D. or HYDRA, or maybe both. So they're trying to deal with their espionage, double espionage, usual spy thriller kind of stuff. And it's been, it's been interesting. Can't lie. We've had some great guest stars as well. Pat Oswalt, Adrian Pazdar, Patrick Brennan is set to star as Blackout, who, as we know, is a Nova villain. So maybe we could get a tie-in for Guardians of the Galaxy. And then set to return in the season finale, we have Maria Hill and Nick Fury. But wait. If you've seen Captain America the Winter Soldier, you may have some questions. This month, we had four episodes of Arrow, which seemed to be very Slade-centric. Yeah, which is fine. A lot of Deathstroke action going around, kind of messing up Ollie's world. The exciting part for me this month has been all the Flash tie-ins. We had two characters from Star Labs over in Starling City, Caitlin and Sisko. And it really just shows how DC is really making a strong effort to tie all their universes together into one. So, that's some exciting stuff. Arrow has just been on fire this month. The storyline going on with Thea, Ollie, Black Canary, the fact that they finally have made use of Dinah Lance, Katie Cassidy's character, it's a, quite a relief because in the comic books, she's quite the BA. This show is just on point. And Deathstroke, mm, Deathstroke has been on fire. By the season finale, this show is going to have us in quivers. Womp womp. We had two episodes of Avengers Assemble this month. Marvel's doing a great job of just introducing characters in animated form. Uh, we had Galactus and the Guardians of the Galaxy making appearances, as well as Ant-Man. So again, just laying the foundation till they're on the big screen. This cartoon has been great. As we said, we're getting introductions to the Guardians of the Galaxy, and they seem to be taking on Iron Man for some strange reason. Hmm. And as well, we get Ant-Man coming in there. Also note that if you haven't been watching, if you liked Captain America the Winter Soldier and you liked the Falcon, he's kind of in the cartoon. You should check it out. And is more true to the source material. A little. A kind of. Not a lot, but enough. And this month, we have four episodes of Game of Thrones. Now, we promise... No spoilers, but could you believe it? Oh, wait. Dragons? Oh, dude, don't even get me started with Daenerys? No. Daenerys no. is like. No, no it was crazy. That should be bonkers, yo. Oh, bonkers. my God. It, basically, we're not going to tell you anything. Just check Facebook, check Twitter, check your social media. You probably know more about it than we ever will. So, check it out. Spoilers. They're books. This month, we had an episode of Hulk and the Agents of Smash. And this one, they got a little taste of Deathlock. Now, the Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. aren't the only ones who are messing with Deathlock. What we had here is a more true-to-form version of them. And we also got a good look at the Super Scroll. That's right, guys. Not only the Super Scroll, but all the scrolls. And this is great introduction in animated form. If you're not familiar with them, you really should be. The Kree Scroll War might be a part in the Marvel Future movie universe, so definitely check it out now. He just blew my mind. 
the Kree Scroll War, cinematic universe, animated form. Let's make that junk happen, yo. Word. For reals. Nerd. This month we had one episode of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles on Nickelodeon. Uh, this episode, the turtles play a little D&D game, or a game reminiscent of Dungeons & Dragons, and find themselves lost in the fantasy world of gameness, when it becomes too real. This episode looks to bring a little touch of Jumanji and Zathru into it by bringing this game to life for the turtles. Should be cute, should be fun. Turtles, check it out. Cowabunga! I don't think they've said that once in the, in the entire series yet. They haven't said Cowabunga? They have not said Cow BOYCOTT! This month, we have the series premiere on BBC America of The Real History of Science Fiction. Now, what this show is going to do is explore the relationship between science fiction and reality. It's going to have a lot of great people, the creators of Battlestar Galactica, writers on Firefly, Doctor Who, Sherlock Holmes. It's going to be amazing. BBC America has brought us this groundbreaking series. We had two episodes this month, including the series premiere, which was about robots. And we had Rucker Howard talk about his improvisational, inspirational monologue from Blade Runner. We also had some people talk from 2001 a Space Odyssey talk about how. And we even had people from The Matrix talk about Agent Smith and just the future of robotics and what it's really meant for reality. And then our second episode was about space. And we had special guest Nichelle Nichols talk about working on Star Trek. We had other, other people from 2001 Space Odyssey talking about recreating that imagery. And we also had just some really expansive explore, uh, exploring looks with even the people from Firefly. So really the full history of things and just how sci-fi has become reality and how reality affects sci-fi. It's interesting. Did you know actually that NASA recruited Nichelle Nichols to help them look for astronauts? I did because she was pretty and people like Star Trek. That's true. The more you know. Do, 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 do. And lastly, taking a slight detour off the normal TV Nerdiverse news, uh, Project Runway Under the Gun had a Marvel-themed episode this month, April 3rd, on Lifetime, uh, getting inspiration from Black Widow, Thor, Captain Marvel, Hawkeye, even the Guardians of the Galaxy. Designers had to come up with costumes that were reflective of these incredibly bold, stylish choices. We had a special guest judge, one of the Warriors 3. <gasps> no, not Volstagg. Not What is it with you and Volstagg? Lady Sif herself, Jamie Alexander. It was awesome. Sashay away. This month we had Original Sin number zero, written by Mark Wade, art and colors by Jimmy Chiong. Well, you know what's really cool about this? This is the zero as you're getting ready to set up the big summer event of Original Sin. This is going to be big, setting up a lot of things coming up. This is mostly going to involve Nova. The, uh, the Guardians of the Galaxy, and we're going to get a big mashup with the rest of the Marvel heroes. This is going to be big. Yeah, guys, I don't usually endorse prequels like this, but a zero is really necessary for this storyline to really understand the characters and really get the precursor, the, the intro knowledge to this huge story arc, so definitely worth a read. And Amazing Spider-Man number one returns, written by Dan Slott, art and colors by Humberto Ramos. That's right, Otto Octavius, no more. Peter Parker, he's back. This is now the time for Peter Parker to really take advantage of his life. We have to, a new number one, a fresh start. This is a perfect place to start for any new Spider-Man fans. This is a must. Exactly, guys. You probably think you know Spider-Man, but this is Spider-Man. This is Peter Parker, amazing Spider-Man. He is finally getting the reboot in the comic universe that he deserves. Please read it. Yeah. Did you know he does whatever a spider can? Always. Right? He's Spider-Man. Spider-Man, Spider-Man, do whatever spider can. We also had Inhuman number one, written by Charles Soule, art and colors by Joe Madureira. Now, you know what's really big about this? This is the comic book that's setting up the next wave of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Inhumans. This is big. Get on this right now with the number one. The entire Terrigen Mist is going to be taking over the, uh, the Marvel Universe, creating more superpowered characters. Which is interesting, since they can't use the word mutant, here comes the Inhumans. Called it. This isn't just a clever marketing ploy. This is vernacular that's been set in the Marvel Universe for quite some time. So it's great to see it actually get fully introduced into the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And this is a great launch point. So read it. Definitely Love it. Pick up. Check it out. For sure.
And humans do whatever in humans do. I made that up. And lastly, in the Marvel Nerdiverse, we have Kick-Ass number three, issue number eight, the final story arc written by Mark Millar and art and colors by John Romita Jr. Now, I'm a huge Kick-Ass fan. You should be too. This story has been incredible. It deserved enough to spawn two movies and four graphic novel versions. So this is the full culmination of the Kick-Ass storyline. Hit girls in jail. Has that affected her fighting prowess? Kick-Ass, can he be a superhero without her? Really heavy, really great, really super humanitarian reality stuff. Check it out. You know what's funny? I call this the Mr. Fantastic book because it's a stretch. Okay? This is... He's fighting the uncle of the brother of the cousin of the mob boss? Yeah. Way to phone this one in. Aside from a little st pulled strings in the villain department, it's still a great journey, it's a fun read, and it's really a good coming-of-age story. Almost paralleled, but not quite, to Spider-Man. Unnecessary. Glad it's over. I like it. I peed on it. In the DC Comic Nerdiverse, we have four issues of Batman Eternal coming out, written by Scott Snyder and company, art and cover by Jason Fabic. Well, what's really interesting about this is this is another year-long weekly series by DC following right off the heels of Batman Zero Year. Because you know what we needed? A weekly Batman year-long series. Well, I don't... I kind of think we did need it. I think it's nice to have a throwback to the original character in his original format. Obviously, there were comic books back in the day, but a lot of these stories were told through newspaper and print. So it's nice to get that weekly format, that really pulpy, kind of edgy stuff. That really leaves you with cliffhangers and gets you on the edge of your seat. You know what's really interesting about that is that back in those days, comic books were 10 cents. You know how much they are now? Uh, yeah, yeah, I do. Yeah. I, I, three ninety nine. Thanks, Dan Diadeo. DC also brought us Aquaman and the Others, number one, written by Dan Jurgens, art by Lan Medina and Ed Tadeo. Well, you know what was actually cool? Do you remember that storyline in Aquaman where we learned about the others and the super hero team he joined before the Justice League when he hated humans and the surface dwellers? Well, now we get a monthly about that. Congratulations to you, Aquaman. This is the first time you've gotten a spinoff title. Well, I don't know. It sounds kind of interesting. It sounds like they're putting a little Namor in their Aquaman stew a little bit. A little hating humans underwater action. But you know what? We need a grittier, darker side to Aquaman because we need any other side to Aquaman because yes, everyone, everyone doesn't like Aquaman. Not true. I love Aquaman. And you know what, DC? You really want to impress me with this Aquaman and the others? You get Paul Levitz back on there. You bring back the Death of a Prince storyline. You bring back the Fisherman. You bring back Black Manta and Mira and Arthur Curry Jr. Handle that business. Marley out. I'll just be happy with Aqualab. Kaldor is not Aqualab. Garth is Aqualab. He watched too much Young Justice. I'll be happy with N Aqualab. Okay, I'll take it. Lastly, from the DC Comic Nerdiverse, we have Sinestro number one, written by Colin Bunn, art and cover by Dale Eaglesham. Finally! Sinestro gets his own comic book. Can I be honest with you? That is the only reason I was reading Green Lantern. Finally, we're going to have someone doing him justice. I can't agree more. Sinestro is my favorite character in the Green Lantern universe. Really complex anti-hero. He's been on the side of fear with the yellow ring causing havoc. He's been on the side of the green with the willpower and also causing havoc. It's really interesting, the complexities of this character, and I really want to explore it. So Sinestro, cool, badass, awesome. You know what will make him really even more interesting? Is if he came to Earth and bitch slap Guy Gardner. Or Hal Jordan. Definitely Hal Jordan. I'm sure he's done that a couple times, but just, you know, one more time for, like, for good, good measure. Yeah, absolutely. In Dark Horse comic Nerdiverse news, season 10 is here. Season 10, Angel and Faith. Season 10, issue number one. Uh, written by Victor Gershler and art by Will Conrad. That's right. Well, I was curious about this title. It's called Angel and Faith, but Faith is over in Buffy. So, what's Angel going to be doing in Magic Town in London? I don't know, but I'll tell you what. If it's picking up right where Season 9 left off, this comic is going to be on fire! I just always like when other people play in the Whedon universe. I know Joss or Zack don't have a lot to do with this issue or this series, but they still created the characters, they still spawn these ideas, 
and it's really nice to watch other people play with it. And in honor of Hellboy Week, which was this month, we have BPRD, Hell on Earth, issue number 118, written by, of course, Mike Mignola and, and company, and uh, art by James Harron. That's right. You know, what's really cool about this issue is we're finally going to get to see that big fight between Liz and the Black Flame. You know, we got the, the, the Russians on the, on the brink of death. Hellboy, it's, it's just craziness. This comic book has just been amazing, like consistently amazing. 20 years of Hellboy, and hopefully we'll get 20 more. Hellboy, if you haven't seen any of the movies or any of the other comic books or spin-offs, you really should be checking this out. There's a reason that this has been around for 20 years. Mike Mignola really has ignited this incredibly imaginative, parapsychological thriller world where really anything in your imagination can run wild and Hellboy will be out there to stop it. Yeah, and here's hoping Hellboy 3. Ooh, I wish, I wish, I wish. In Image Comic Nerdiverse News, we have Dream Police number one, written by J. Michael Straczynski, art and cover by Sid Katian and Bill Farmer. Now, what's really cool about this, the story takes place, it's about Dream Police, all right? Joe and Frank are partners, they've been partners for years, and all of a sudden, Frank wakes up and Joe's gone. In comes a lady who says that she's been his partner the entire time, and she has no idea who this guy is that she's talking about. So now Frank has to go through trying to figure out what exactly is going on. They're going to go through different levels of dreams, and it sounds like it could be really fascinating. And you know J. Michael Straczynski, he's always got layers on layers on layers of super intellectual craziness. So this could be cool. Yeah, guys, they're basically delving into the conscious, subconscious. There's going to be changelings and wisps and ethers and just a whole bunch of levels to the dreamscape that hopefully will really fulfill the story and really flush it out. I'm not necessarily too excited about this, but it is the start of something bigger, so J. Michael Straczynski, it's worth a shot. And you know what's really cool about this? You ready for when they finally option this as a movie? Dan Aykroyd, Tom Hanks. Like, like Dragnet for your dreams. Giant snakes and, and goat men. It's gonna be as good as that sounds. I like Dragnet. So Image brought us four issues of Shotgun Wedding this month, uh, written by William Harms and art by Edward Fun. Now, here's what the story is about. Man's about to get married. Okay. Girlfriend finds out that man used to be engaged. Okay. Also finds out that the man who used to be engaged left his soon-to-be wife at the altar. Okay. The soon-to-be wife at the altar was professional hitman. Okay. I'm pretty sure she's a little pissed off that she got left at the altar. So, like, Kill Bill with a sitcom? Yeah. And shotguns. Shotguns. Sounds romantic. Yeah. In IDW comic Nerdiverse news, we have Transformers More Than Meets the Eye, issue number 28, Dawn of the Autobots, written by James Roberts and art by Alex Milne. You ready for this? Sure. Guess who's joining the Autobots and leading them? Joining and leading? Yeah. Uh, it's Megatron. But Megatron's the bad guy. I know. Megatron's going to be leading the Autobots into space. You know craziness is about to get down. So lastly, in the IDW comic Nerdiverse, we have Ghostbusters number 15, written by Eric Burnham, art and cover by Dan Schoening. That's right. It seems that Lewis Tully is under some uh, very weird happenings again. It seems that Ghost of the Gozerian is not quite done with him. For those who are missing Ghostbusters or clamoring, aside from Dan Aykroyd, for a third Ghostbusters movie, this is the only way you're going to get it. If you really need your Ghostbusters fill, this is where you fill your addiction. And always remember, if someone asks you if you're a god, you say yes! You, you say yes. In the Valiant comic Nerdiverse, we have Unity number 6, written by Matt Kint and art by Cafu. That's right, the team is struggling to pick itself back up, and it seems as though Ninjak and Dr. Silk have their hands quite full. And guys, this has been a very creative, very interesting comic to check out. The art's fantastic, Matt Kind does some very electric, exciting writing. So if you're looking for something a little different, a little off the beating path, try this out. Also from Valiant this month, we had Quantum and Woody issue number 9, written by James Asmus and art by Kano. That's right. Continuing how funny this book has been, it seems as though Woody needs to get a life for himself. And in order to do that, he's got to get a job, a bank account, and overall be an adult. And, well, it's not really his style. 
And while the art might be by Kano, this has nothing to do with Mortal Kombat. Don't make the same mistake that I did. Fatality! So guys, this is my favorite part of the show. Here's where I get to yell a bunch of thoughts, feelings, emotions, and opinions, and hopefully make a point. Today's topic is racism. Now, a pretty weighted topic in pretty much all contexts, but specifically we're going to talk about racism in comic book movies. And to help us do that, I brought in a black man. A black man, motherfucker! And to do that, I brought in an African-American. Motherfucker, I've never been to Africa! Uh, I have Marley here. Yeah, I guess. So guys, uh, racism in comic book movies. Specifically, we're going to talk about Fantastic Four, the new movie with Michael B. Jordan as the Human Torch. What's the issue? Great, young, up-and-coming actor. Yeah, he happens to be of color, not white, black, African-American, whatever, not white. And that seems to be very upsetting to people. Meanwhile, when white actors play non-white roles, nobody seems to care. John Wayne is Genghis Khan. Johnny Depp is Tonto the Lone Ranger. Liam Neeson is Ra's al Ghul. But meanwhile, when black, non-white, people of color play white characters, everyone loses their minds! Idris Elba is Heimdall in Thor 3, Samuel L. Jackson is Nick Fury, Kerry Washington is Alicia Masters in Fantastic Four and Fantastic Four Rise of the Silver Surfer, Sam Jackson is the Octopus in The Spirit, Jamie Foxx is Electro in Amazing Spider-Man 2, Halle Berry is Catwoman, Billy D. Williams is Harvey Dent in Batman. With the way that they butcher these stories and ruin these characters and destroy these universes, does it really upset you when they change the color? How many movies recently have they just completely destroyed any true original intention or integrity of the original material? Spider-Man 3, X-Men The Last Stand, The Dark Knight Rises, X-Men First Class, Batman Forever, Batman and... <laughs> Oh, okay, yeah, All right, we, we got the point, yeah, <clears throat> exactly. And, you know, even the last Fantastic Four movie had my boy Galactus looking like a Sharknado instead of a purple people eater. What's that about? I would have taken a black Galactus over a cloud any day. Galactus? Galactus? I can say that. Sorry. Yeah. Point is... There's been so many white superhero movies in the last five, ten years. They're in no danger. Do you really feel like the black superhero is encroaching or endangering the white superhero? How many exactly white superhero movies have we had? Iron Man, Iron Man 2, Captain America, Thor, Hulk, Incredible Hulk, The Green Hornet, Man of Steel, Batman Begins, The Dark Knight, The Dark Knight Rises. The list goes on and on. And how many black superhero movies have we had? Blade. Steel? Technically? Point is, I think there's enough room in the cinematic universe for all of these characters. So Michael B. Jordan, great actor, great person, happens to be of color. Does that mean that he can't play a guy with fire powers? Is that why the racism is kicking in? Only black people can have lightning powers? Is, is that the issue? Is that what people are freaking out about? Because it would be nice to have a little change of pace on that as well. Obviously racism is deeply embedded in the history of comics. That doesn't mean it has to stay embedded. There are plenty of traditions we get rid of because they no longer apply to society. Let's get rid of this one. So guys, I'm happy to announce we have a very special guest today. We have prolific comic writer, Jonathan Swifty Lang. He's here to talk to us about his newly re-optioned graphic novel, Feeding Ground, as well as all the other stuff he's working on and uh, what he's excited about in today, today's comic world. <laughs> Swifty, thanks for joining us. Pleasure. Thanks for having me. So uh, why don't you just let people at home know just, you know, what you do, how long you've been doing it, and what, what, you, what you're most known for. So I've been a, uh, a writer forever. Um, I've been writing comics for the last four to five years. Um, Feeding Ground was my first book. Um, to be perfectly honest, I got really, really lucky. It was my first project that I took on seriously, and we were basically... Uh, signed at the convention on in 2010. That's incredible. Yeah. Well, let's let's talk about Feeding Ground. It's a very complex story. Yeah. 
Um, it's a supernatural werewolf story set on the U.S.-Mexico border. Yep. So I'm sure there's a lot of politics and socioeconomics that come into play as yep. well, aside from the paranormal element. Mm -hmm. So I'd love to hear your, have, are you from Mexico? Are you from the U.S.? Have you been, did you live around there? Well, actually, uh, I have a friend, Thomas Payton, who's a documentary filmmaker. Okay. Um, and he was making a documentary about border crossing. And mm -hmm. he was telling me stories about basically how harrowing the situation was. Right. And just what was happening in the region, uh, it seemed ripe to tell a horror story. I think for me, what really, how I really connected to the story was a lot to do with identity and a lot to do with how uh, people crossing the border were being represented in the media. The other thing about Feeding Ground specifically was important for us to find those elements that were universal in order to communicate this story. Um, regardless of your background, I think people could understand the desire mm -hmm. of someone struggling to do something for their family. And hunger and the desire to sacrifice for your family is something that's universal. So with the Feeding Ground being newly reoptioned, mm -hmm. how much of the process do you get to be a part of? Uh, obviously as the original source material, mm -hmm. do you get to write the screenplay that you kind of started with and go back to? or? I would say that more than anything else, it's an ongoing conversation okay. where it's, it's the kind of thing where obviously Archaea is very respectful mm -hmm. of, of how we're representing the work. Right. Um, but ultimately, I think if one is going to option something, the understanding has to be that these are different storytellers who are inspired by your work and may take it in different directions. And for me, I'm very excited about that process. Is there a favorite character or a favorite artist or a favorite writer that you have? I always love Spider-Man. I think Spider-Man's awesome. I guess my favorite writer, I really do like Matt Fraction. Uh, I, I think he's great. I think he's great. You know, I, 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 th I just started reading Sex Criminals. Okay. And what I was struck by is he really is able to capture in a humorous way tremendously human moments. When we talk, let's get back to Feeding Ground. Now, what's being optioned, it's mm -hmm. been re-optioned for a film. Mm -hmm. Is there um, a film or comic book in terms of tone that you would like to see it as? You know, I mentioned The Thing, uh, which I just think is a masterpiece. There's something very small about that film. There's something very personal about the dynamics and people no longer trusting each other where they were a unit by circumstance, that's absolutely amazing. The reason the horror works is you are so invested in those characters. A another film I would say tonally that I would like is the first Jaws. Again, Ooh. there's something very intimate about the crew on the boat, the way that the monster is represented. Uh, you just have this sense that it's out there and you don't have to really feel the monster. And I think that if we could convey that sense of something's out there and you don't necessarily see it and you kind of are able to sustain that tension throughout the arc, it's a win. Well, here's an interesting question because this seems to be the hot topic of late mm -hmm. is race changing in comic books. Mm -hmm. And for the big one now, we have Jamie Foxx being cast as Electro. Mm -hmm. How do you, do you feel like it's okay? Is it even an issue? I mean, is there bigger issues to worry about in comic books? Absolutely, there are bigger issues to worry about in comics. And I, I think that... You know, unfortunately, I think that race change has become, in a weird way, a marketing tool. And I think mm. that once that isn't an issue, then it's really the issue is being dealt with. I think that, like any role, if the actor can play the part, that's what matters. All right. Hey, guys. Don't forget to check out Feeding Ground. All right. Pick us up. Being optioned here. Good luck to you. I hope Thank everything you. works out for you, man. Thank you for your time today. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. All yeah. right. Hey everyone, thanks for joining us for another great episode of Nerdiverse Presents. Please make sure to come back from May 2014 for even more awesome Nerdiverse action. If you like what we're doing, check out our Facebook page, like it. If you like this, subscribe to our YouTube page. More is coming at you. Alright guys, thank you very much. And from our Nerdiverse to your universe, we'll catch you next time.